So our next section, we're going to specifically talk about MongoDB. So uh, MongoDB is another NoSQL uh, structure. Uh, I think it's built in the curriculum. You'll notice in the curriculum for section 15, basically it talks if, like I can split up the curriculum into two parts. What is NoSQL? Here's MongoDB. That's kind of the whole section. Um, and so I really suggest is that go through the lab um, for MongoDB is it does a really good job of actually trying all the different parts. So I'm going to kind of show you a little example of how this works. Uh, first thing you should know though is that you likely will have to install. Um, shoot, I can't. There we go. Sorry, I'm trying to move a window out of my way. Um, you can't directly install. I'm sorry. You probably can't use MongoDB right away um, in this in the way. Um, it, what? Sorry. In in your environment. So you'll have to install it through. I think the curriculum talks about like installing Conda Conda install on MongoDB. So just know that you can do that. For example, like put a new terminal here, and um, in uh, Jupyter. And so for example, I have like this part. If I, um, you also want to make sure that you do like source. I actually don't know if this will work from here because I don't have it active. But for example, make sure you're in the learn environments, right? Okay, so in this case I can't do it. I, I want to share it with what I actually have on my computer, but you can't see it on my computer, unfortunately. Um, so let me see if I can share that real quick. Well, anyway, if you have trouble, just follow the directions from, um, Shoot, what's it called? Uh, the curriculum. Basically, make sure you basically are in the learn environment. So that source, source activate, um, learn environment, and then you do conda install. Uh, I think it's MongoDB is the actual command itself. And then once you have it installed, uh, you can basically run this part. Um, show you a little bit. Oh, why is it like this? Sorry, everyone. It bothers me when it's like off the side. I can't see all of it. But um, once you have it installed, uh, you can basically run the server. So this is a little bit different. So just be aware um, is that once you have it installed, you can now run a MongoDB server. And what's kind of fun is that you just do MongoD, so MongoD, um, if you kind of abbreviate this. And so you would take this, for example, I'm not going to run it in here because I already have it running right now. But you basically would run this right here. I'm going to try it. Let's see what happens. Yeah, OK, it gave me an error because I'm already running it. But basically, um, oh, and also, also I'm not on the server. But uh, you would run Mongo, uh, Mongod, and basically this would have kind of similar to when you have Jupyter Notebook running, like when you launch the Jupyter Notebook, you basically can't actually type into it anything. Basically, it's running on your computer. In the real world, like if you're working with some kind of you know business where it has a MongoDB database, they would already have this server running. But this is a way for you to essentially interact with it on your own local computer without having to go online and stuff like this. So just know that you have to do a MongoD first. Um, don't do it in Jupyter Notebook. I kind of showed you, I kind of showed this off right here, is that if you try running this right here, this won't work. I mean, it'll work, but you can't do anything else in the Jupyter Notebook because it'll freeze up everything. But note that it'll default to this part. So I actually think I can go to this right now because I have it running currently. And you can see here, if I go to this URL, this is basically, if you look at this 127.0.0.1, this is home or local host, right? So um, this basically, uh, it's just, uh, and this right here is called a port. So you can see that there's a little colon right there. That's our port. And this is the port number 27017. Why is it this number? I honestly cannot tell you why it's this number. That is the default. I'm sure someone knows exactly the reason why out there, um, why it's this specific port. But basically know that this is like, saying, OK, this is our local computer, OK? And this is saying on this specific part of our local computer, our local host, OK? And you'll see if I try going to this website, it says, looks like you're trying to access MongoDB hey, over HTTP on the native driver port. Basically, it's just saying, hey, you're trying to access MongoDB. What are you doing? Um, so we don't need to access it this way. So just know that MongoDB here um, will actually interact with, it with Python. Uh, you will have to install PyMongo. Um, so just know that in order to run this part right here, you actually have to have it installed. And remember to install it with Anaconda or Conda install. Um, so you can also do Conda install PyMongo. Um, that'll be fine too. But if you run this, for example, and you don't have it installed on your local environment, uh, you'll find that this will not run. So just be aware of those two things. So you got to install Mongo, uh, oh, sorry, MongoDB and PyMongo in order to run this stuff. Okay. So I go ahead, went ahead and import this. So this will allow us to kind of interact with the MongoDB, just like how we um, we talked about SQLite 3. Is that right? You guys know what I'm talking about? OK, cool. Um, I want to make sure I, we talked about it. So uh, just like in SQLite 3, we can interact with that. This is another way for us to interact with uh, MongoDB's database. And I have it running in the background right now. So this is one way to connect it. Basically, it's client, 
pi mongo, right? Mongo client dot mongo client. So we say, all right, we're going to start off the client and we're going to save this basic instance so we can actually interact with the database. Um, note that I put basically our host is our local host, which is basically this guy right here. Okay. And our port is 27017. So this is one way you could do it. Uh, I think the curriculum actually writes it like this pi mongo, mongodb, and just basically pass this whole thing right here. Um, that's another way. This is equivalent to each other. So just know there's two different ways you could do this. Um, just like with pretty much all of programming, you can do it multiple ways. Okay. But once I have my client here, now I basically say, okay, essentially what now is like, I'm saying my client, I'm going to connect with the server. So now I can basically interact with that server, put things in the server, take things out of the server and such. So I can actually do client.list database names. So this will show what databases are actually in Monco. Note that I have a new, couple new ones for attendance and new DB. These are ones that I had put in myself, um, but you'll probably see admin, config, and local if you run this for the very first time. So basically these are our different databases. So these are, you can think of those like our different, um, well, just like in SQL, we have our different databases to interact with, okay? So, um, in this case, if I do it this way, this will actually create a database if it doesn't exist. In this case, it does exist. Um, so you'll see that I'll just connect it here. Okay. But basically this will say, okay, my database, client attendance. So you can see here, basically it's like a list, right? So you can say, all right, get the, get the attendance database, right? So now right after I get that, I can go, go ahead and start inserting um, records and stuff. But before I go ahead and start um, inserting records, I can actually show the list. And this case is not actually not really helpful because um, I already have attendance in here, but let's say, for example, um, I'm trying to think if I can split this up real quick. Let's do like um, DB test equals client. Oops. What should call it? I don't know. Dumb. Why not? Right. So basically, I'm going to create a new database here, and that's as simple as creating a new database. Uh, you'll see though, if I run this, you shouldn't see database in there because I haven't added anything into it yet. Okay. Uh, and maybe I'll show you how that looks up, but you'll see that done doesn't show up because basically it's an empty database and MongoDB is pretty smart being like, if you don't have anything in there, I'm not even going to try to uh, make a new one until you're ready for it. Okay. Uh, this right here is list collection names. Basically this will show me what's inside of my um, client here. So you can see here, for example, I have attendance. So basically my clients is attached here. Uh, if I did something for example, like DB test, you'll see I got nothing in here because nothing exists yet. I have to actually add something into that database. I just know that's a little different. So um, kind of show you a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll be using attendance, but I'll show you quickly what this done is. I can actually insert, geez, why does it do this? Okay. All right. So um, you can actually start inserting records. So I'm going to go back to our attendance clients right here, our database, okay, our collection. And so right now I'm going to create a record into something called students. So I'm just going to get the attendance record, okay? So our attendance uh, collection. I'm going to call it students. Okay. And so now I have, um, this is kind of like similar to um, a SQL part. So now basically I'm within the database that's attendance and I'm specifically going to make a collection called students. And you can see here, I think I already existed before. Let's see here. What was this called? Um, IDB. You can see here attendance already exists here. Okay. So I'm going to take this key and this way I'm just defining whatever I want. And in this case, I'm just creating uh, our different keys, name, age, state. Um, basically, this is some quick code um, that another instructor, uh, Raphael, did another tutorial. So I'll link that video too. So that way you can do that in the student resources. Um, but he kind of uses this structure, which is actually is super useful. Basically, um, he's creating uh, what you, you do right here. You take each key, name, age, state in a list. And then I basically have this part. It's like, so the name will be Victor. It's a age will be 28. It's state will be California. Okay. So this is basically creating this right here, this creating a dictionary, okay? But I could have equivalently done the same thing where I create this Victor equals, and you can see this dictionary with the curly brace. So you can see here, if I run this, you can see my database, right? Or the database, sorry, dictionary, okay? I could have equivalently, if I could comment this out, if I did the same thing here, you'll see that's the same exact thing. I also, uh, last one, I could have done like a dictionary comprehension. So I could have done like something like this, like, uh, I could have been like um, key value for something like this. I could have done something like that and created a uh, loose comprehension there, but I'm not going to do that whole thing because that's redundant. But maybe it's like you can basically create a dictionary and this will be your new record. So once I have my new dictionary here, which is going to be a name, Victor, age 28, state, California, 
I'll go ahead and insert. I don't know why it does that. Whatever. Okay. Um, I'm going to insert this into the database. So you can see I'm going to take this dictionary. Remember, that's all this is right here. And I'm going to insert this into the dictionary. Or sorry, into the collection. All right. So I actually have this in here. And you'll see this little results part. So we'll talk about what this looks like. So one thing I could have done is done, well, this won't, um, how do I say this? Uh, okay. Well, just know that this is now inside the database itself. I'm going to introduce it one at a time. But now I have this record, which will have, we'll say, okay, your name is Victor, age 28, state California. So you can imagine this traditional SQL. It's like in that table. My table, the column would be name, age, state. And then in that one record, it'd be Victor, 28, California. That's kind of the equivalent going on here. Okay. I can also add multiple parts. So for example, I have this person called anti-Victor, which is going to be Victor minus 27. AC is their um, record right here. Okay. Same thing with Newston, max 25 OR, right, for its state. I'm just making stuff up. And then I can insert multiple records. So basically, I create a list of multiple records. So let's say I say, like, okay, here's a bunch of students, and I create a bunch of students, I add it into one list, and I can insert those all at once versus inserting them one by one. So now what will happen is I'll have my records in here. So I'll just kind of show you what this looks like. So this should be a list of dictionaries. So you see each part is a dictionary in our full list. And then I'll go take my students database, right, or collection. I'll insert many records, and you can see I have all of these parts in there. So if I see here, like I showed records, what's kind of cool, you'll see here is that I have our name, age, state, right? Picture like this part. But you'll also notice that there's a new part here, okay? Which is the idea, but you notice I didn't put that in there myself, right? Before. So just to kind of show you is that when I have this example, let's say I'm John State, Arizona, age 28, okay? If I run this now, okay, you'll see that when I have this results, I actually have an object ID here. Okay. So what's nice is that basically this is the way MongoDB keeps track of what record is in there. So for example, I could add Victor over and over and over again, right? But is it the same Victor? Or is it someone who's also named Victor and such like this? Um, so it actually keeps track of this object ID here. And that's what this is showing up on here. It's basically modifying this dictionary. So kind of be aware. So what's interesting is that I now try to run this again. Okay. Remember, I haven't changed anything. The example is this thing. If I try inserting in this there, and again, does anyone got an idea what this will do? New ID. New ID. So maybe it'll give a new ID, right? So let me go try to run it again, right? And I try to run it and, oh, what? Okay, it gives me an error. Basically, it's getting this duplicate error. And that's because it knows that this example, okay, so kind of this example already has an ID in here and this ID already exists, okay? So if I instead run, let's say if I run this again, so the same part, so now there's no ID. So if I just to prove it to you guys, there's no ID here, right? Okay, so now if I run this, okay, and we get an idea what will happen now when I run it. We'll find out, right? Okay, and it does insert it. And it turns out if you look at this carefully, I should get the other one, but you can see this carefully is that you can see that there's a new uh, object ID here, okay? So we'll show you some of this read records. So basically this object ID is, essentially saying very specific to that one record. So that way we can say the same exact data over and over again, but it's a different record. So we recognize that this is a new person. They just happen to be John in the same state and also age 28, which you can imagine there's probably multiple copies of this exact situation, right? So that's the reason why we have this. But it's nice that MongoDB will say, hey, you can't, like, we can't reinsert the same exact record. So it gives you a little error, okay? So uh, any questions on what's going on here, um, how I inserted. The main thing here is that I'm inserting new records um, essentially into our, um, our collections, our basic, equivalent to our table, basically within our document. Okay. So I kind of showed you, so I should have a few records in here. I should have uh, Victor, um, anti-Victor, I guess, which I just called Victor, Max, um, and I'll have John twice, right? Because I had John put in twice. Okay, so let's see, read our records. So we can actually go ahead and check out our whole record. So right here's just a quick list comprehension. And that's just so I don't have to print it out. Um, but basically I'm going for a P and student, could have been any variable. Um, I'm going to do dot find. So the important part of this students.find, if I were to write this out myself, you will see students.find is essentially just an iterator. Okay, basically it's saying, like, okay, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So to actually find it out, we'll actually go ahead and print each part out. And you can see here is that each one of these parts 
okay, is our person. So for example, the very first thing I added was Victor. You can see here there's also Victor, but you'll notice that it's anti-Victor because it's minus 27. AC, I just give it random stuff, right? And then you can see here, uh, for example, I have Max, okay, age 25, and I have John, like I said, twice, okay? So those are all the records. So this dot find basically um, will use criteria in here to say, hey, find everything or find whatever. In this case, this is a quick way to just find all the records in here, okay? You wouldn't necessarily want to do this if there's a lot of records, but uh, this is for the small database is a quick way for us to look at it. Okay. And note that I can't just do dot find, I have to iterate over it. Basically, you can think of this kind of like a list like object, right? So, uh, so you can kind of think is that, well, if I can do find, right, I can probably specify very specific parts. So I, I, if I want to find everyone, but everyone who, uh, everyone but only list the name and the age, I can just pass this criteria. So note that if I just did, so I put like, like this guy, you'll see that will pass everyone. And I have this optional parameter right here, which is basically saying only display the name and the age. So if I print this now, you'll see each part. I only get the name and the age. And you'll see IDs here too, just to signal who's who, right? And you can see each ID is unique, but I only get name and age because I didn't get the state. Um, if I didn't want to include name and age, I can just do name uh, zero, age zero as parameters. And you'll see now I'll only get the state for each record, okay? So this zero or one basically is signaling saying, hey, um, either show this record, one, yes, show this record, or zero, don't show this record. Excuse me. Um, any questions on how I'm able to find this? Excuse me. So um, just to reemphasize, this first parameter of find, okay, is basically saying, you know, who should I look for, okay? And the second part is saying, okay, of all the people I found, okay, in this case, that um, empty brackets is just everyone. Of all the people I found, what should I display? In this case, oh, display name, display age. The opposite happens here is I don't display name, don't display age, display everything else. Okay, so those are the kind of things that we're specifying here, right? So as we saw in find, we can specify output, but we also might want to search for output, right? We want to, we want to search the records. So for example, let's say I want to find everyone who's like Victor. So for example, I can do the results.find, and you can see here where name is Victor. Okay, and remember this is our search parameter here. Okay, so this will show all the information for everyone whose name is Victor. And you can see there's two people, in this case, age 28, age minus 27. Okay, so this is specifies specifically who do I want to find, all right? You can also do things like modifiers. For example, I can say, find everyone whose age is greater than 26. So you can see here, this will include uh, Victor age 28. I think it will also include John's in Max. Oh, Max is, I'm sorry, Max is 25, so I wouldn't include Max. So you can see here, I got everyone whose age is over 28, okay? And again, just to reemphasize that, we could also have specified what specifically you want. Like, say, okay, I only want, let's say, uh, name. I only want name, so just one, and you'll see only name will show up here, okay? Cool. So those are the ways we kind of um, can search our records, display our parts. Um, we can specify what kind of output. In this case, I say, okay, I don't want name, I don't want age. I can do find records for specific parts. For example, I want name, um, I want age. I could have also done um, a combine of this part. So just to kind of show you that we could also combine these parts in here is I can do, sorry, one. Okay. So I can do like name. So I want to find everyone whose name is Victor, but it's over 26, it should only be this one, right? So if I do this now, you can see I'm here, okay? I could also have done uh, other things around here. Um, I also didn't have to give this parameter. I could have said, all right, just give me all the information about um, that per the people you found. And you can see here, I found it here, okay? Cool. All right, um, and then note that, um, like I said, uh, this greater than, this is a little modifier. You can use these kind of things to help specify specific parts. Um, they're specific to MongoDB, so there's this little link here. And you can see, for example, you can do greater than, equal to, greater than, equal to, or greater than and equal to, um, and less than. There's a bunch of other logical operators you could do. So um, there's a whole bunch of things you can see, like different evaluations and stuff, okay? And what's kind of cool is that you also have some extra, spe um, extra special comparisons, like geospatial. Um, we have bitwise. That's not really what we care about, um, all that stuff. And there's some extra elements in here too. So just know that there's a bunch of things you can do within this different query stuff. But we have to put this greater than if we want to say greater than 26. 
Okay. And what's nice, um, as you might have noticed, is that this is all like JSON format. So basically, JSON format, or you can think of it like dictionaries for Python. Okay. Any questions on this so far? Looking pretty good. Thumbs up, sideways, thumbs down. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, any questions? Okay, cool. So I'm just gonna show you quick things. These are all pretty much from the curriculum, just kind of re-emphasize. Uh, I just showed you how to search the, basically read the different records, right? I showed you how to insert the records, and then I'm basically showing you to update and delete. So this is also reference CRUD, C-R-U-D. Basically create, read, update, and delete. That's basically for all database interactions. That's essentially all you're gonna do. So, uh, for example, if I want to update, for example, I want to take uh, Victor, and let's say I want to go ahead and set his uh, age to 29, and say, hey, I also want to say that it's his birthday in here. So you'll notice that birthday didn't exist before, right? But I'll go ahead and insert this anyway. So now if I go ahead and insert this in here, I can say update one record with update one, update two, right? So you can do this separately, okay? And then I can say, all right, let's double check for Victor. So let me go ahead and split this out. So for example, I'm going to update him. So I updated his age to 29, updated his birthday, okay, because his birthday was today, okay. And I'll run this. And you can see here is that now, what's kind of nice is that I now have a birthday here for this person, but you notice that anti-Victor, we didn't add a birthday in here, he doesn't have a birthday. So it's nice that you can basically structure this however you want. If you wanted the specific records to have specific attributes, you can do that kind of thing. Should you do that? Depends on the situation, right? But the idea is that it's very flexible. In SQL, if all of a sudden one's like, oh shoot, I want to add um, a birthday column in there, SQL is not going to make it really easy for you to do that. Um, you're essentially going to have to add a birthday for everyone, including null values. But here basically allows you to very quickly um, basically scale up and change things around. So this allows a really cool update. But if you just wanted to update their name, this would be how you would set this up. Okay, cool. All right, so I'll go ahead and go on to delete. And so let's say we want to get rid of Victor, okay? So let's say get rid of delete one. We're going to say, okay, delete everyone who, or sorry, delete the first one with the name Victor, okay? And so we'll go ahead and delete them. And you can see it deleted just one person. If I go ahead, let's go back to reading records. So I'm going to go, well, okay, we'll just do this again. So if I want to see like everyone who's Victor now, you'll see is that the first Victor was gone, okay? So I removed the one who was 28, not only 27 is there. And so if I go back and let's say I delete again, remember I'm only deleting one, and I do this, okay, this will delete the next Victor. So if I do here, this should be empty, and you can see there's nothing there, okay? If I try to do it a third time, so there shouldn't be anyone who's named Victor anymore, but I'm only deleting one record at a time, you'll see here just zero. So it lets you know if you delete one or zero, okay? Um, I could also do something with everyone who's like less than 28. I'm gonna do less than 29 because that's John, Mm, yeah, we'll just do that, okay? Um, or we'll just less than 27. So that should include max, basically, right? So I think that's the only one who's under um, age of 28. Yeah, eight, under the age of 28, seven. So you can see here, it can delete uh, one person right here. And then if I want to delete many people, so if I go back to actually finding everyone, right? If I want to find everyone, you can see there's two Johns here. If I want to delete many, many records at once, I can just do delete many and I can give specific things. For example, I could have like age 28 or you know name John or whatever I want to do. If I do just this, this will delete everyone. So you can kind of think of it as like, it'll find everyone that's based on these criteria and then delete them. So if I do this, it'll delete everyone. So if I run this right here, you can see here to delete results. I didn't print it out this time, but you can see here if I run this again with, oops, not update, find, okay. So this will actually be empty and we can see everyone's gone. So I deleted all the records in here. So something to keep in mind is that be very careful about deleting many with this empty um, brace right here. This will essentially just let you delete things all really quickly. Okay, cool. All right, and that kind of sums up all of this stuff basically for creating, reading, updating, and deleting. Um, any questions? I know I'm running through this pretty quickly, but hopefully you get an idea of what things you can do and kind of how this interacts. Okay. Any questions at all? No? Feeling pretty good? Thumbs up? Sideways? Thumbs down? Okay, I see some sideways. I see some up. Okay, cool. I don't see anyone like, I don't know what's going on, um, which is, you know, if that's true, that's okay. Um, and most of it, like, honestly, I don't expect you to, like, now know everything about, you know, MongoDB. 
this allows you basically to kind of show you a little bit what you can do. Um, something really quick I want to just talk about is just that there's a MongoDB shell. So you can actually run, run Mongo directly in here and you don't have to use Python. You could technically use Mongo and actually um, go into like the terminal here and type in, you know, well, this won't work, but if I type in Mongo, oh, good, it does work. So you can make Mongo here. You can actually interact with the database directly. So for example, I can see what database it is. Um, I can actually say use, what was it, attendance. So I can use that database now. So you can basically interact with this directly. So I can do like, um, let's say attendance. Well, I won't go into full detail, but basically know that you can now interact in the same way you would interact with Python. You can go directly into the terminal and interact with MongoDB um, or with your database. So you can see here there's a bunch of ways. This is showing you how to connect to it. Once you connect to it, you can say, all right, use this certain database. You can say, okay, after I'm using that certain database, I can say, all right, use the database, that collection. I can insert a record, for example. So if I do, um, Let's see if we go back to here. Uh, attendance, uh, students. Okay, that's my collection, right? Which there's nothing in there um, in this case. But uh, oh, is it students? Okay, yeah. So now you can then interact with this. You can insert records directly in here or whatnot. It's all built around JSON. So basically, more or less, your code will more or less basically work exactly the same way um, as it does right here. All right, awesome. So again, any questions, anything you guys, any comments? Any concerns? So, Victor, why would you want to do it directly rather than through Python? Is it faster or something? Not necessarily. Um, really what happens here is that when we're doing the client.connection here, um, there, uh, I'll, I'll rephrase that. I don't know if it necessarily would be faster. There might be some subtle differences that might matter a whole lot. But my guess is, depending on how it's built, but my guess is that essentially what you're doing here when you're connecting with the client, you essentially are sending um, Python, you're telling Python, write these commands and basically inside the computer, the computer says, all right, we're gonna write these commands and push them off to MongoDB. So basically it's just another way to do the same exact stuff. Um, the reason why you might wanna use the terminal is that let's say you are on, you uh, connect to another computer, right? Uh, you connect to a computer and you, um, what's it called? Uh, this is my thought. You connect to a computer, like you SS I'm trying not to use big terms here, but you SSH basically, you connect, log into a remote computer, let's say onto like a server or in the cloud, and then you say, we well, want to directly interact with MongoDB. Maybe Python's not set up in that environment or something like that, and you just want to get in there really quickly and just change something. You can then do it directly onto there um, versus having to say, okay, let me go ahead and connect it in this way. But for the most part, um, you probably want to connect in this way. So that way you can have a list of your um, commands and everything like that, and plus you probably feel pretty comfortable with Python itself. So it'd probably be useful to do it this way. Okay, does that make sense? All right, awesome. Um, good question though. Uh, any other questions? No? All right then, so I'll go ahead and stop recording.